uh, Bevan Doe. She is a physical scientist in EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. She has worked on the NAMES data analysis on and off for 10 years, first as a contractor and now as a member of EPA. And she is going to be speaking to us remotely. I'm happy to be here virtually to provide a status update on the analysis of the NAMES data set. For today's talk, I'll provide a quick overview of the draft reports available and a little on how the reports are laid out. Next, we'll go over the uses and limitations of the models, then wrap up with a review of the schedule and next steps. In the spirit of transparency, we've been releasing draft reports to let you know how we are approaching the model development and what preliminary models look like for the different animal types. You can think of these drafts like progress reports to show everyone how things are shaping up and to give you a chance to provide feedback. So far, we've released reports for swine, egg layers, and broilers. Each report encompasses multiple pollutants, and in the case of egg layers and swine, multiple source types on the farm. The image to the right shows you what the site looks like, and it includes the project quap and the reports from 2012, in addition to these draft reports. I want to reiterate that all the models are draft and subject to change in any of these reports. We've restructured the reports since the swine report was released. We split off the material that applies to all animal types into the process overview or all sectors report. This includes items like background information on the consent agreement and the name study, a summary of the data collected during names, and the overview of the model development process. This prevents the information from being repeated in every report, which streamlines individual animal type reports. The individual animal type reports include specific information um, on that animal type. These contain literature review, exploratory data analysis, and other details of the model development process specific to that animal type. So all the information on layers is contained in one report and broilers is in a separate report. So you can go directly to the information you need for the animal type that you're interested in. The swine report will be reworked to follow the same format and the upcoming dairy report will follow the same format as well. Before we move on to what's coming up, I wanna take a moment to reiterate the uses and limitations of the models. With respect to model application, these models estimate emissions from animal confinement and manure storage sources. Air compliance agreement participants must use the final models to determine whether their emissions trigger certain Clean Air Act permitting requirements. Other animal feeding operations may use the final models to determine whether their emissions trigger certain Clean Air Act permitting requirements. The final models may also be useful for general estimates of emissions from operations across the U.S., such as emission inventories, or the comparison between operations in different regions. The current draft models should not be used for these purposes until they are finalized. As these are draft models, the final versions may change based on feedback we receive during the comment period. For example, the manure shed model for particulate matter will likely change before the final report. We encourage you, we do encourage you to test out the models to see what your estimate is, but do not base any permit decisions on the values produced from these draft models. When the models are final, EPA will provide a tool that will apply the model to emission estimates for farms. There are also limitations to these models. The models do not estimate emissions for all pollutants or for all emission sources found on animal feeding operations. There are more pollutants than just ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and particulate matter size fractions and VOCs from farms, but these models only focus on those emissions. They also only cover emissions from barns and manure storage sites such as lagoons and basins. Equipment such as boilers, generators, and farm vehicles are not included in the emission estimates and might be required in determining your applicability to permitting thresholds in your area. You will need to consult with your local permitting authority to understand any specific state or local regulations affecting permit calculations. These models do not incorporate all the site-specific management factors that can affect emissions. The models cannot be used to quantify impacts of best management practices on emissions. That is to say, the model estimates uncontrolled emissions 
using the typical management practices employed at the time of data collection. If you would like to take credit for emission reductions due to best management practices or any type of control for any potential permitting you might be subject to, you will need to discuss the process and needed documentation with your local permitting authority. And that brings us to what's next. Um, this is a table straight from our website. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we're drafting two more reports, um, one on the dairy sector and another on VOCs for all of the animal types. Um, the date on the website does say March for the um, dairy report. The dairy report, however, is not available yet. It should be coming. It's gonna come um, probably at the end of May with the VOC report. Um, after all these initial reports have been released, then we'll um, take what we've learned and make revisions across all of the um, reports. And after that, we get everything polished up, we'll release revised reports and then have a formal public comment period after that. Um, it currently, it's looking like that'll be mid 2023. And then after we receive all those comments and we take them into consideration, uh, we'll release our final uh, reports and the final versions of the model. The date will depend on the level of comments that we receive during that formal stakeholder um, review process and comment period, but we are targeting the end of 2023 for those final reports. And that is the status of the project now. If you have any informal comments on those draft reports that are available, you can email me um, at doe.bevin at epa.gov or the NAMES project email address, which is simply names at epa.gov. Um, all this information is also on the project website. Um, so you can find out all the reports there and find these links uh, to email us with comments. Um, and that's all I have. So we'd like to open the floor for questions uh, for all of our panel members at this time. Thank you. All right. Uh, yes, let's give her a hand. Do we have any questions? Do we have any questions that have come in? Not on chat. Okay. Any questions from the floor? Yes. Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, so my question kind of gets back to the, uh, the timeline and process for putting these models into place and really the, the discussion on how the models don't have a capability to sort of address those best management practices or controls that might adjust emissions, I, you know, if kind of the point of this is to uh, show compliance with any kind of permitting or regulatory or administrative consent order or other, you know, other permit requirements, it seems like the, it seems like best management practices or some kind of controls would be a really crucial part of, uh, of these models. And so I guess I, I'm, I'm looking for some discussion on, you know, why or how that's not included or not able to be included and why that kind of needs to be that local discussion with the, you know, with the permitting authority, either at the local or state level that may not have, uh, you know, the background and depth of expertise that, that EPA has put into and, per and Purdue University has put into developing these models in the first place. Um, it's a very good question. My understanding is the way the study was designed originally was that it was designed to measure uncontrolled emissions. Um, and this happens a lot with other industries. Uh, it's kind of the standard emissions and creates a baseline and kind of, if you will, a, I don't want to use the term worst case scenario, but um, we talk about potential to emit for different sources within permitting. Um, and so it gives us more of that potential to emit from different systems. Um, and it is standard practice, even with um, anything ranging from power plants to other facilities um, to use uh, references from literature or um, specific on-site measurements for specific control technologies on the site to account for any differences from those uncontrolled emissions produced by any emission factor from the AP42. Um, this just allows um, it to be more site specific um, when the context, larger context of names, trying to account for every different type of uh, emission control method that's utilized 
it at farms across all these different animal types was just, it's too big <laughs> really to kind of uh, handle within a study like this. Um, and so as I alluded to with other sources, we, the thought is that uh, animal feeding operations would be able to use the same process where you can find um, a study that um, recorded or tested the emissions um, with the control and without the control to see what type of reduction you, you, you can get from that control and then apply it to the emission estimate from our models to get the reduction of what your farm's uh, emissions should be. I think the biggest one that we've looked at is um, litter additives. We've tested it out um, a couple of times. We had some secondary data from a different study um, to, that actually used an additive to reduce ammonia emissions um, in the litter using the model and what that product's estimate of emission reductions was. The numbers did look reasonable and uh, the model um, with that percentage reduction um, match the emissions fairly well from that site. So it's standard practice and it looks like it's working so far. We'll do some more testing on that when we get through. And what we're hoping to do is um, as we get closer to the public release date, we'll have some additional guidance to go along with all of the reports that talk about implementation. And I would have a follow-on question to that. Yeah. If the baseline emission value or model shows a certain value and then a, a particular farm is using some method or species or um, practice that would increase the emissions beyond that, would that, could that also apply as well? Yeah, um, it cuts both ways. <laughs> um, if you know you're doing something that has the potential to increase emissions and if it's established, um, usually a peer-reviewed journal article is sufficient enough to establish what that emission change would be from that process. Um, it, you can have emissions added or have emissions actually subtracted from um, the estimate that's coming out of these models. This is a little different question, but it's for Bevan. I think I, I um, heard the term watershed model and uh, I'm mm -hmm. not sure I uh, understand that. Is was that um, have an airshed concept, concept or is that uh, another way of a, I guess I missed the uh, interpretation of that model. Okay. Um, I don't know that I said watershed model. I know there are watershed models that look um, for water permitting, um, kind of looking at the um, total load into a watershed. Um, and air quality monitoring, we do talk about um, air sheds, um, but from the perspective of these models with names, um, we are just focused on kind of in the immediate ambient air around the, the facility itself and how it would affect um, ambient air quality. That might have been, an, if it sounded like I said watershed model, it might have been a small audio issue <laughs> and I apologize. Question, Ling Yang. Hi, you said that uh, once this model are finalized, you you know encourage a farm to use it, estimate their emission. They would check uh, you know their emission against the Air Clean Air Act, mm -hmm. uh, any regulation. So can you briefly review? Like currently, you have ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, you have PM model. We'll see, right? What kind yeah. of likelihood, uh, you know, which piece of regulation this likely will trigger? Um, right now, um, the original intent with the consent agreement was for the models to uh, be used to look at um, EPRA and CERCLA reporting, as well as Clean Air Act permitting thresholds, so like Title V permitting thresholds. Uh, right now, farms are exempt from reporting under EPRA and CERCLA. Um, should that be reinstated, um, and this is an Olam area, so I don't know what the uh, current status of that is. Um, there's a hundred pound per day limit, or rather a hundred pound per day threshold um, where farms are emitting more than hundred pounds per day of ammonia or hydrogen sulfide. Um, it's just a one-time reporting requirement to say, this is, um, there's a potential for our farm or our farm has been known to um, exceed that 100 pound limit and um, might be contributing to those pollutants in the atmosphere. Um, past that, um, the Clean Air Act Title V permitting requirements are still there. Um, there's no specific reporting requirement for ammonia. The 
big one would be PM two and a half, um, and it's 250 tons per year. That lay, that gets ratcheted down as you go into non-attainment areas. So if you're in the San Joaquin Valley of California, um, I believe there are serious non-attainment area um, or um, one of the more strict areas. So they're going to have a lower threshold um, to meet that. I think we've done some preliminary calculations based on the draft models. It doesn't look like they're going to be a lot of facilities that approach that threshold and those that do would be in. Uh, those serious non-attainment areas and are probably already discussing permitting or at least emission reduction um, possibilities on their um, site with their local permitting authority. So um, I think right now it looks like generally um, if anything does come out of this from a respective permitting process, um, most of the people um, who might be caught would be people who are already talking to um, their local permitting authority. Again, we'll have some guidance that goes along with this where we'll try to map it out a little bit better and we will have, um, we're working on a tool to go along with everything and it'll have all the thresholds um, specific to your area so you can see if you're approaching any of those thresholds. Any other questions from the floor? Yes, go ahead, way back there. Going back in time 20 years to when this first started, mm -hmm. what changes would you make to this study if it were to be redone today? Well, we, we wouldn't use that VOC method that we tried. We would spend, spend more doing um, probably more summa canister uh, method. We, we would revisit the VOC method for sure. And we probably wouldn't uh, measure so many high-rise uh, facilities, since high-rises are really going out of style and have been for quite some years. We would probably, but, but that was a decision that was, that was made by the commodity groups and you know, they, we had their input and, and that's what we knew at the time. Um, we, we saw that high-rise facilities were the majority of the facilities, even though um, you know, in, the, in the future, after, in, later then belt batteries became more prevalent. And of course, since the names, there's been a real push toward um, enriched colonies, air berries, and other types. So uh, even the belt batteries that we measured um, were probably going, or be going out of style as well, uh, different frequencies of manure removal and so on. There's a, there's a lot of things that we have learned uh, from the study. I guess I'm not, not really prepared to say anything more than that. Uh, um, I, I think we, if, if, it was, if it was up to me, I, I, I still would go with the intensive method of, of measuring uh, the way we did. Um, in, in the case of, a, in the case of a, uh, a broiler facility, we basically measured everything on the farm because there are no lagoons and outdoor manure storages. Um, we, we obviously didn't cover everything. So we, we would re revisit um, you know, the methods. In some cases though, for the naturally ventilated dairy farms, we probably want to go with an open path, whole farm method, or use mechanical ventilated barn to represent the naturally ventilated buildings. And I, I give an example, even in California, when, when research was being done to estimate the emissions from a feedlot, what they did, uh, I think at the University of California, Davis, a hoop barn was built over a feedlot surface, a fan was put in the hoop barn, and that became a mechanically ventilated structure to estimate the emissions from a, a feedlot surface. So that would be definitely where I would go. We, we would not uh, try to measure emissions from a naturally ventilated building. Any other questions? So uh, I have uh, se several questions, but uh, I'll, I'll just throw, you know, two of them. One is uh, just, you know, for those, uh, you know, stakeholders who would like to, you know, you know, check your, 
your 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 your, your models. Would this would this data be available somewhere, the curated one, so that you know if somebody is interested in you know checking or doing a model, they would test it out after you're done. That's number one. And then the other second one is more to uh, for iron. Uh, you know, you talk statistical you know models, and that was great. And statistical models are known to be you know very uh, you know, specific to uh, parameters, ranges that were done. What happens uh, when, you know, cases where you are outside the parameter ranges where the data, when the data was collected? And then number three or two for the statistical, are you considering using machine learning algorithms to kind of help out, you know, figure out this data? Many questions, I'm sorry. The, the question about whether the data used to develop the models would be available to the public, is that what you're asking? Yeah, well, well, well the, the data, the names data has been posted, the daily averages, at least the daily averages have been posted by EPA because we submitted the data to them and, and those are all posted on the web, on, for, on the internet. And I would let Ian answer the question the other questions about the model that she, he asked. It's, it's about being valid, uh, you know, outside the range that the data was collected. Yeah, so uh, I mean, as you could see, we're doing the, um, the sensitivity analysis, uh, one of the slides I was showing there. And so that's one of the things that we are, we are testing is um, uh, how, you know, the conditions does, how, you know, the, the, the data is collected on a, a wide range of data, right? So we have pretty wide range, but we are testing that to see um, when, if the models, how well they do uh, beyond the limitations. Um, so that, that is something we are, we are looking at and, and examining, and that's you know, something that will be addressed at some point. From Ling Ying. My question was um, earlier in the presentation, you mentioned uh, negative emissions. Um, I was wondering how uh, you determined that like a site was a sink versus like with the naturally ventilated barn since the uh, ambient and outlet concentrations were so close, like how did you distinguish or how did you explain that um, a site was a sink for um, some gas emissions? I, I didn't quite understand the entire question uh, but did you ask about how how did we deal with the, the naturally ventilated building, which had inlet and outlet concentration so close? Uh, uh, you mentioned earlier that some of the sites that you um, did measurements on were uh, sinks for um, emissions. And I was wondering how um, how you explained that they, they are sinks and not sources. I, I, I still... Oh, okay, the negative concentration. I do have a slide explaining that. The negative concentration, uh, the, the, the way we calculate concentrations is we would calibrate in the field every, every so often. So we'd have a control chart uh, showing the challenge of a, of a certain span gas and how that instrument would, would um, respond. And of course, it's not, it's not responding the same every time, so, so we would, we, we would have a line that would go across that and um, we, would be fitted to, to that. And so that would be the model that we would use to correct the raw data to the actual concentration. And, and there's, there's noise in there, right? So there's noise. And uh, with the instrument noise, we could get a slight con a negative concentration. So if, if it was near zero, if the concentration was supposed to be zero, and we're trying to measure it, we'll, just with instrument noise, we'll get some negative concentrations. So, so that's really be, be, because it was, um, it, it was adjusted based on a control chart model, based model. And, and, and because of that, we would get some slight negative, they're, they're slight, they're slight negative concentrations. Okay, or, or if the concentrations were very low, like nitrous oxide, or PM 2.5, you know, you know, some of those are very low anyway. And so with the noise of the instrument, we're going to get some negative concentrations. Thank you, Al. Uh, my question is for Ian. Uh, you had this model 
you had the sensitivity analysis, you have many statistical criteria to kind of evaluate. And anytime we model, we need them. You know, understand the performance model, right? To check that, then you also you are on, have uncertainty. You know, you cannot average the many sources. You know, together on the farm. I just like to uh, know in the ballpark, what's your um, you know result for different type of model? What kind of uncertainty do you have for the current current draft models? This, oh yeah, it's working.、Um, The uncertainty that was at the end of the, the presentation that was associated with the the annual emissions.、Um, so we, yeah, we haven't developed a,、uh, yeah. So that that's what we're looking at there, and that's characterized by the random error. So,、um, your question is, say it again. I mean, it varies from from model to model,、um, from you know from pollutant, and it just you know it depends on. Yeah, I mean, we have、uh, some models that perform well、um, uh, in terms of you know the the normalized mean error.、Um, uh, some of the models,、um, yeah, yeah, about thirty percent. Some of the good ones,、uh, but that's for、uh, the, that's the normalized mean error. So that's all all in the report. Um, but there, there are some ones that are, are higher as well. So, are they all acceptable? Because you, know, you must have a criteria when you develop a model. It is not acceptable. Keep refining the model, right? Well, that's still to be. We're in the draft est,、uh, emission estimating、uh, methodology process, so we haven't. You know, we're, we're welcoming feedback, and、um, that I think that's still to be still to be determined. Thank you. I, I don't know if Bevan wants to add anything to that. Yeah, the only thing I would add is, is kind of what you talked on the end is you know we're releasing these as a, like a progress report so everyone knows where we're at. It's not like when the public comment version comes out, it's not been a black box. You can kind of see how these have evolved over time, and again allow a chance for、um, informal feedback to say, oh, well, you should really consider this because there's this new study that says this variable is highly related.、Um, but yeah, what we're doing now is once all these initial kind of progress report drafts are released. We're going back through and reanalyzing things and trying to tweak them and get that、um, more optimal performance out of the models by incorporating some lessons learned on subsequent animal types. The best example is we're looking at using more、uh, models with emissions normalized by inventory, particularly for animal types where the population and weight are fairly stable across、um, the entire study. So things like the milking center. Spoiler coming up for the new report.、Um, we were look, we've tested out some models that are normalized by emissions, so we have that component to get at the size of the house, but、um, not on the predictor side of the model. So there are different things that we're kind of trying, and we'll probably circle back and test that out with a couple of the poultry models as well to see if we can get better performance from the models using an approach like that. Uh, one one more important question I have to ask, just like when we do research, we go through peer review、um, process to get the work published. I think this is your EPA work、um, before you have a science advisory board. So I know you have this open period of public comments. Are you going to bring any peer or you know advisor or you know science you know advisor board to to work with you, check it with you? You know, like how do we Improve the model, or you just、uh, have open public comment period, and then you finalize things based on what? Yeah,、um, that's a very good question.、Um, currently, what we're looking at doing is、um, the AP42, which is kind of our big compendium of emission factors through EPA across a whole bunch of different industries,、um, has a standardized review process where we have a listserv、um, or group of emission inventory experts. Um, and a formalized review process through them, where、uh, we get them to review all the reports, the models themselves, and provide feedback.、Um, we have been going out to、um, industry representatives,、um, state and local representatives, to let them know about these reports, and we'll contact them directly again when we go out for、um, public comment、um, to make sure they're aware that it's available and ready for review. I think it's 
We're still trying to determine if we really need um, like a very formal federal register notice for the formal public comment. That'll probably all get decided um, next summer. Um, I'm really hoping to get all this out by next summer. Um, uh, and yeah, some of the process will, de will depend on um, preferences from the um, EPA administrator at that time, but there will be, uh, we are reaching out to, like I said, um, representatives of the industries, um, all of our partners uh, in academia um, to let them know that this is available. Um, USDA has also been reviewing our reports. We're getting feedback from them. We have a ammonia and agricultural work group um, who've been providing feedback throughout this whole process. And we're very grateful to all of them. And we're incorporating um, their comments. Some of them are taking longer than others, but we're getting to them. Um, so the short answer is yes, we're doing this and we plan to do more. And I know we're bumping up against lunch, so I don't know how many questions. Uh, is there any more questions? And that probably should bring us to the conclusion here because we're five minutes over, although we started late. But I think we, in order to get every, the conference back on time, I think we'll conclude this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bo and uh, Dr. Rumsey for your presentations and um, thank you for participating in this session.